Um, so thank you everybody for coming to this uh, teaching today. Um, I think I almost know everybody in the audience, so I'm expecting good discussion and stuff. Feel free to interrupt me, because um, basically everybody in this room has told me to stop talking at once, so I know that all of you will have plenty of comments. Um, this is a, a platypus teaching, so I just kind of entitled what, what is Marxism for, which is maybe like an impossible question to try to, you know, convince everybody in a, a night, but hopefully I can provoke people enough. Um, you know, it's maybe everything uh, you ever wanted to know about Marxism but were afraid to ask, that maybe this would show up tonight. Like all those kind of questions of, did he really say that wild stuff? Did he really say that wacky stuff? And then also kind of what to make sense of it today. Um, meaning I'm not gonna really give like a political program of this is what we should do. Maybe Marxism was, um, you know, uh, as uh, Jonathan Sperber put it in an interview for the Platypus Review, like a 19th century thing, and right? he's like, Marx is a 19th century life. Um, or maybe it continues to have some kind of purchase today, and it's not because I bring it up, but because people spontaneously kind of reach for Marx or Lenin or whomever um, when trying to make sense of politics in the world. Um, if you just think about what has happened in the last 48 hours, actually, I have already seen plenty of people reach for all sorts of things out of the history of Marxism um, to make sense of uh, what has happened. And so in that sense, it still seems to be there in the background. Like if at one time communism was, you know, a specter haunting Europe, now maybe we can say, well, maybe Marxism haunts people in a certain way. So I just thought I would get into this teaching. Feel free to interrupt me. In any second, ask any questions. I would even prefer challenges. Don't be like, I agree with you, amen, go, no. I, you said this, but I read this online. That's the, that's the we'll beauty find. of the teaching, is it's not like a lecture. It's that's the beauty of, it, of, it, of the teaching, absolutely. So, just getting into it. So, <clears throat> and I'll try to talk slower and louder because apparently I talk fast and quiet at times. Um, what is Marxism for? The usual answer is that it is, quote, scientific socialism, and that it will give the proletariat the science for revolution. But which science? There's Marxism, Marxism-Leninism, Marxism-Leninism-Maoism, Freudian Marxism, Western Marxism, all kinds of Marxism, Weberian Marxism. To answer this, we really need to go back to why Marx and Engels ever became who they were. The story of Marxism really does not begin from a first principle, but begins rather with an ongoing story, an ongoing crisis. Marx and Engels are neither, neither anti-enlightenment, nor do they simply build on the enlightenment in a progressive sense. So they're neither like the counter-enlightenment Right? Like, they're the opposite. I don't know, the Enlightenment came out of the bourgeoisie and they're the opposite. Nor are they just the progressive history of, like, they're just, there was Francis Bacon and here's Marx. Rather, as Louis Menand has described them, and this is from a uh, epigraph that we read in the primary syllabus, we'll be reading it again in two weeks, actually. They are, quote, philosophes of the Second Enlightenment. Okay, well, if they were philosophes of the second enlightenment, then this raises another question. What was the first enlightenment? The image usually given of the enlightenment is of some European man with a powdered wig on and stockings, and he's pontificating about rationalism and science and individuality in a kind of, you know, sophisticated way, bon vivant, like, uh, uh, kind of thing. Um, some kind of Monty Python sketch, maybe. Uh, even more confusingly, because the image is usually labeled bourgeoisie, and one knows isn't Marx against the bourgeoisie, there is some sort of received intuition, like some kind of received image, that Marx is opposed to this. Whatever that kind of image we have of the powdered wig person, you know, who's kind of thinking about themselves like this, Marx is supposed to be against that. That's the bourgeoisie. Um, even if Marx seems to genuflect certain figures. So he calls himself, you know, the pupil of the mighty thinker Hegel, right? So, okay, maybe he likes one or two of them. But this would confuse two things, bourgeois society and the Enlightenment. So I think usually people conflate them and turn it into the same thing. They talk about Enlightenment values, 
or the Enlightenment and the Revolution, it's kind of the same thing. The former, so bourgeois society, had been around for at least 300 years by the time the Enlightenment came about in the 18th century. The latter was taking stock of an ongoing revolution. And just to stop for a second, bourgeois, urban, so my dad is from Brooklyn, New York. He's from the borough of New York. Bourgeois means urban. And the Enlightenment was taking stock of the urban revolution. So to get there, we have to get at where did that even come from, that there would be this idea that something happening in the towns was different than had what had happened in the towns prior. Go ahead, yeah. And that industrialization, is that what you're getting at? We'll get there, we'll get there, we'll get there, yeah. But um, no, you're going in the right direction because that's actually several steps ahead. Yeah, um, that's this page <laughs> going down. So as Immanuel Kant wrote in 1784, um, you know, in the essay, What is Enlightenment? So maybe that would be worth looking at. Uh, they, so these people, the, you know, writing in the Republic of Letters, these enlightened figures, were not living in an enlightened age, but rather the age of enlightenment. So they were not saying we have arrived at it, but we're actually only coming to what the very task is of this kind of society that's been put in motion. And the way that he put it, was it was of man's self-emancipation, self-emancipation, so a kind of freedom that has to be done consciously through people's own activity. And there's a lot of different translations of this, but one of them is self-incurred tutelage, or self-incurred juvenility, or nonage, meaning he's saying what we're starting to see in the 18th century is the task of self-emancipation from what was thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years of, in a sense, uh, dependency, bondage. Um, you know, he's the one who kind of coins the term sapra audra, which I'm probably mispronouncing, but dare to know. That one doesn't have to be born into the world in a specific place, but can transform and know. And, you know, it might seem kind of very arrogant for this one random person to say this in the 18th century, and yet he's saying only now can we actually truly recognize that as an end in a way that might have actually even been considered arrogant prior to such. So, um, you know, if you think in the Bible when uh, Jesus meets Pontius Pilate and Jesus says, you know, I, I bring truth, and Pontius Pilate says, what truth? He kind of mocks it. Right, meaning even the ideal of truth and knowledge was not always a value to human civilization. It was considered arrogant. It was you are a finite being. You know, you're a poor worm of dust. Who are you to know the true essence of things? Maybe only certain people can know it. And so the idea that that even would become a value, they had to explain why it was that people even started to value knowledge and truth out of anywhere. So to be radical, and I guess, you know, I, I see all the posters for radical organizations, so it raises that question. Um, as Marx reminds us, uh, is to grasp the root, and the root of society is man. So literally, that's what it means to be radical, like root, so going after the root. Um, this view, which everybody knows from Marx, does not originate from Marx, but rather is inherited from the Enlightenment's bourgeois radicals, meaning they already asked this question in the 18th century, what is human? What does it mean to be? And the reason they were asking this question is because what was happening in the Enlightenment was not that people were like smart out of nowhere, but rather they were like, wait, what is human? What is the point of all of this? Is there any purpose to life? Is this all a waste of time? And, you know, in a lot of ways, this was prompted by, and we read this the first week of the syllabus, Rousseau, who kind of raises the question, you know, what does it mean? Uh, what is human nature? That was the question he was responding to. And he kind of led people, uh, excuse me, left people with a rather provocative question, uh, excuse me, answer, which is that maybe it is human nature to transform human nature. That in a sense, what was most human, you know, otherwise, yeah, maybe I am, what is it? What does Stephen Hawking say? I'm just like a slightly smart, you know, ape, like some kind of descendant of some kind of monkey species, and I'm just a normal animal, blah, 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 whatever, I'm just like other animals. Um, and so in that sense, there's no real difference between me and a lot of different kinds of animal species in terms of, you know, we have 
hands and eyes and things like that. And that maybe what most distinguishes humans is that they transform and produce what their species even means. That we even ask the question, what is a human? Which a grasshopper is not going to ask. Which a platypus is not going to ask. Right? They're not going to reflect on what does it mean to be these things. And Go ahead. And, you know, the fact that one even asks that question can read to an even deeper question of what even led someone to ask that in the first place. And so this is what's prompting the Enlightenment in the 18th century. They're actually even looking back at the entirety of human civilization and saying, what makes this all not a mistake? That however moral we think we are, maybe we just you know, entered into civilization to enslave each other, to slaughter each other, to create new, new ways of killing people and torturing people. What would at all even justify civilization at all? Right? It's why Rousseau is sometimes considered a primitivist today, and he's not. He's actually a very deep thinker. So the Enlightenment radicals regularly gave a certain account. They would kind of do this. I'm kind of paraphrasing a lot of different people, so see if you can pick them out. So about 10,000 years ago, give or take, uh, this funny little animal decided to lay down a stake in the land and settle. Um, it had grown tired of hunting for food and running away from danger. Instead of reacting to what nature brought her way, this new species began to imitate the seasons of nature, right? So this, whatever this new animal was would herd cattle and breed them, husbandry. And it had once seen, you know, lightning kind of spark a prairie fire, maybe. And went, well, what if I imitate that, right? Then I'll be able to kind of, you know, cook my food and not have to simply, uh, you know, kind of fortuitously come across fire. So it started to plant agriculture and raise animals. This truly was a revolution. It's usually called the Neolithic Revolution today. After mimicking nature, down to the lightning that made a fire and the rotten fruit, that's where alcohol comes from, uh, you also mimicked those around you. Families as we know them today did not exist, but rather you identified with everyone uh, around you. You kind of all held that we descended from that kind of feathery animal that was kind of floating around. That if you went back many, 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 many generations, at some place there was some kind of transfer over. So you kind of identified with that animal. And you would identify with that because it actually made sense in terms of holding even the community together. Meeting the basic necessities of food allowed the community to defend itself uh, from the past that was still floating around it, meaning there were still nomadic tribes, nomadic groups that would sometimes come and steal your cattle or steal some of your food or attack you. Um, but what was potentially stronger about this new kind of group that had settled is that in growing its own food, you could also allow certain people in the tribe to start practicing fighting all day, right? Meaning certain people would kind of hunt and gather, and then the other people, I don't know the people who were the tallest and looked the strongest and most ferocious, they would just sit there and practice fighting all the time. And they became pretty good at it, right? And if you think about a lot of ancient civilizations, they usually had a warrior caste. It's not hard to imagine how this kind of um, happened over time. That was something fun. So the basic precarity of the situation was such that communities only were to the degree that they continued to exist. In this case, that meant the support of those who justified the existence of the order. The, little, the lower orders were little distinguished from a natural state, meaning literally people we can even say just emerging from nature, still living closely based on instinct, meaning it really was hunt, survive, the end reproduce, go forth. Um, it therefore followed that what was good and true, if we even think about the very beginning of even that term, like good, uh, was that which persisted, that which is, in the most basic sense, uh, that which had a good outcome. So if somebody did a dance and it led to a better harvest, that was good, right? Morality in that sense was after the fact. We didn't judge people on attention, but kind of on outcomes. To conquer, this is going to sound a little odd, was but the affirmation of the truth of the community. After all, one who conquered acted according to their nature. 
If they conquered, they were born that way, and the fact that they were able to do so was most consistent with nature. Um, the concentration of social power on certain central families made them seem to go beyond the general order. They became deified. They became gods over time. Those who worked also bore the mark of being conquered. Uh, those who ruled spent their time not only administering, meaning you had to, in a sense, shepherd over the people, but also they would justify uh, their existence through culture, right, through certain kind of rituals, but also sports, meaning what are you going to do when you're not fighting? You're going to practice your athletic feats. Jousting. Go ahead. Like jousting. Jousting, coliseum fighting, something. Aztec kickball. Aztec kickball, which I just found out. Go ahead. That was from the rich people who didn't have to work. Yeah, and it was, yeah, it was like the warrior caste. Yeah. And you can think that if you were someone who worked, in a sense, it was literally signifying that you were conquered. Yeah. So they distinguished themselves from not working. We'll get to the. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I guess I would um, I don't know, throw out an annotation that the idea of like um, leisure, sports, things like that. Not necessarily was it, um, you know, just a thing for those who could just rule and do nothing, because when you think about it in like certain hunter-gatherer societies, you don't have to work that much. Yeah. Oh yeah. A lot of your the portion of your day could be spent for leisure after you have just gotten enough for what you need to eat or what you need, or what your community needs to eat. So <sighs> humans always had not always, but um, for lack of a better term, humans had more access to leisure than we think. Once there became a ruling class, then right. there was, yeah. that leisure was well, that's, taken yeah. away. That's the significance of the development of being like martial caste, like what would evolve into like feudal ruling families. They have their ways of living, they have their art, mm -hmm. they have their like martial sports, you know, jousting, um, like these things are like hard, rigid rule, you know, that comes out of the nature of those who rule. I guess it's just something that you do as a noble person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it's music. I was just yeah. reading, uh, yeah. you know, Nietzsche recently. And, you know, it's going to trace music all the way back to the, you know, going from nature to civilization as a kind of early way in which people. So yes, there's true. If that's true, and also people didn't work as much and stuff. Um, I guess my point that I was trying to get at was that the very differentiation of orders very much was based on those who had to work and those who didn't. And the reason I was kind of setting it up like this as well when we get to what happens in bourgeois society is that, of course, when we think about the rulers in ancient society who are praising I don't have to work, it seems kind of funny to us today. Because even the wealthiest people on earth today go, I worked for it, yeah. right? Yeah. Meaning they actually reflect the epochal transvaluation of values. And it's not that people woke up in the 18th century and decided working is cool all of a sudden, but it actually became the case. Right. Um, the Protestant work ethic. These different things, you know, it's, it's one of these things I was gonna go into, uh, so continuing on this line um, in the sense of, um, you know, the community was also held together through forms of ritual um, this is the birth of a lot of religions, and, and we follow Hegel, who we'll be reading uh, on Sunday. This is an early form of freedom, right? And by the way, since I already mentioned his name, Nietzsche, Nietzsche is not anti-religion. Of course not. It's early form of freedom. Yeah. So this was known as traditional society, and this was a kind of thing that was coming out of uh, the bourgeois revolutions of how they were differentiating themselves from civilization hitherto. Now. Many years ago, Mike McNair at a, a kind of platypus teaching said, well, hold on one second. In the fifth century, didn't the kind of fathers of the church say that they were the moderns and they called like the ancient Greeks and ancient Romans the ancients? And that's true. They had their own kind of justification for themselves of they had heard the word of God and those were heathens. But it's meaningful that all of a sudden in the bourgeois era, they're like, actually, it was all one thing. Right? Meaning, like, yes, things have changed, but actually this running kind of undercurrent. So freedom in the ancient sense meant here not freedom, meant freedom to be because what was ought to be re reproduced. Right? So I know Alexander Pope is not exactly this, but I always like to bring him up. Essay on Man, where he says what is is good. It's a kind of succinct way of thinking about what it meant 
in terms of ancient freedom. And we know why this also made sense because certain questions that we have about freedom were not there in ancient society. And it's not that they were there and they weren't apparent, they truly were not there. So freedom, Moses, let my people go. Freedom to be, freedom to be Jew, freedom to be Assyrian, freedom to be Egyptian, freedom to be the closed form and shape of your community. And I also like to bring this up because it's a little provocative and so I'll raise all the provocative things today. Uh, productivity, having a lot of stuff, having many things, was not necessarily a value in ancient society either. And why would that be the case? Because it disrupted the community. Meaning you can maybe trace you know, the, the kind of cause of early pogroms um, to that you would have nomadic communities show up to your nice divine chain of order and they would start trading and all of a sudden groups of people who were not supposed to have that thing had that thing or we would have more of a thing and it would mess up the price, the tribute you were supposed to pay. They messed up everything. Okay? And so we don't know who they are. We're going to chop their heads off. Whereas today, like, it's actually a value. Meaning if you follow the economic news every five seconds, it's all about what are the growth numbers going to be for France or Germany or the United States or anything. It's a value per se. Go ahead. It's a value per se because it, it can be a value. So to quote this guy, uh, De La Manet, this is from 1839. Um, he was a, a French writer. He wrote a text called Modern Slavery, and it's one of the earliest terms I know about of using the term proletariat, so going into the kind of Marx point. So among the ancients, the people was not. What we call the people were slaves. They were laborers, tillers of the ground, household servants, mechanics, sometimes even professors of the liberal arts, poets and physicians, citizen, and in virtue of this title, invested with public functions, the free man governed, administered, and judged, or exempt from all save domestic cares, lived idly on their own revenues or on the revenues of the state, the state providing for all citizens unable to work or to support themselves. In living on the work of others, traditional society was relatively stagnant, and we can even see why it might have been a value to make the world go round, meaning that's, that was the order of things. And uh, I'll give you another example. So David Hume, on his deathbed, he talks about reading, I believe it's Virgil. I believe it's, it's I'm forgetting the exact study, but it's somebody going to the underworld from an ancient Greek yeah. poem. And they're talking to the person at River Styx, right, before you cross over to die. And basically the questions that they're asking this person in kind of uh, ancient Greece is, you know, did you leave land for your family? Is your daughter married? Does your son have a house? And if that's the case, you can die. And that was good. Yeah. That, was a, that was the good life. And not only was it a good life, but probably hundreds and hundreds of years later, after that person died, the world was still kind of the same. Meaning your great 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 grandchildren were like you. So there's not really like like individuals like so much as just like bodies that keep society going around. You just have serfs who are the the family crest of arms yeah. that some of you might have. In other words, you're just the tenth iteration of Henry the whatever. Yeah. Right? You're just one thing. And the land is you, and all of these things like this. Um, and actually, I, I'm glad you bring that up, because I'll now go into the very idea of an individual, which we all hold probably very deeply, when you're thinking about all the nasty things about me in the back of your head right now, that now I disagree with him, he's very bad. Um, how this is a new thing. So in living on the work of others, traditional society was relatively stagnant. It could only extend through conquest. Wealth as such was not the aim of the community, but rather that which strengthens and maintains the order, which produces virtuous citizens. So if you lived in a Jewish society producing Jewish people, if you lived in a Syrian society producing good Assyrians. It is very possible that this could have continued indefinitely and the fact that there were still traditional communities existing up until very recently kind of points to the fact that it very well could. So in the same way that the Neolithic Revolution was kind of accidental, it's very possible traditional society could have gone on forever and then whatever, the planet ends in the end. 
in retrospect, when we look backwards, we see the reasons that could lead to modern society. Over time, the declension of ancient societies led to their dispersion and stratification of the ruler and ruled. I don't know, patricians and plebeians, for, for example. An empire built on conquest and slavery eventually ran into a contradiction. Rome collapsed, meaning they would conquer people, but then it was like, how do we start producing things for our army that has to conquer? Well, only slaves could, could produce things because the free men couldn't really do the same things. The whole thing started to kind of stagnate. Kings and dictators who ruled uh, absolutely were eventually compelled to grant power to local lords. So this happened during the so-called feudal era. Around some time after the 10th century, there started to be a peculiar phenomenon. In the cities, a new society was developing based not on primogeniture, so inheriting land, and on, or on conquest, but rather based on labor. Um, so I'm not going to pronounce the German, but there is a, a, a phrase kind of from medieval Germany that if you had run away to uh, the cities and stayed there for a year, you were free. And so the translation is city air makes you free. Right? Yeah. Well, Go ahead. I want to know why. Because what was kind of emerging in the cities, and these were kind of the bombed out cities from the Holy Roman Empire, was the emerging bourgeois society. So what Kant will be talking about in the 18th century maybe has a long history going back to even the 10th century. The Italian, you know, you started to get things like cities, like very, like not meaningful for uh, hundreds and hundreds of years, but you know, eventually you have the Italian city-states. Um, you know, you have uh, growing up, uh, this is where the term burger comes from, like a burger, bourgeois. Um, oh, really? Yeah. So it's like a new food, new type of food? No, I was, well, <laughs> oh. I was sticking with the H in it as well, but I know it's, it's a homonym, so it kind of sounds like that, yeah. It's a, oh, it's a German word. They would say someone who lived in the town was a burger. Oh. Yeah. So that's why I was saying, like, my dad's from Brooklyn, borough. It, these are all different translations of the same term. So bourgeois is just the French for burger, and German is like burgerlich or something. So they were, go ahead, yeah. Never mind, never mind. No, no, it's, <laughs> it's, you, you, had, you had actually asked a good question of why is it that city air would make you free, right? Like, I don't know, there's like, there's the, Mar there's the Marvin Gaye song, it's the, the blues of the, the city then, right? Um, because what literally was developing in the cities was an entirely different society. And spontaneously. Well, that's true, right? Yeah. Because that distinction is still there, even in a lot of different characteristics that I can imagine, but also like politically as well. Like there's, I feel like there's usually different like political identifications that people identify between people who live in rural areas and people who live in like, city areas and stuff as well. Yeah, no, today, there, I mean, certainly there are different uh, geographical ways in which people uh, are politicized. I would say that the difference between cities and the countryside uh, in what I'm talking about right now is like qualitatively different. Yeah, that's definitely Meaning, like, yeah. Go ahead. No, I'm. Oh, no, you go. So the, the Adam Smith line I always bring up from book three, and we just read Wealth of Nations uh, a few weeks ago, is that the lords treated the burgers, not the sandwich, but the people, um, <laughs> as if they were an entirely different species. And, you know, we'll get to it, but in a sense, they actually look like they were thinking in a different way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I know there's some people in here who like art, uh, you know, Hauser, Arnold Hauser's uh, Social History of Art, this four-volume book. Uh, in a lot of ways, he ties different kinds of art to what's happening already in the Renaissance, in the Italian city-states, to what was happening in the cities in general. Meaning, the people in those towns if your day-to-day -day life is one kind of based on exchange, the exchange of labor, it's actually making you think in a different way than, say, the peasant life, the idyllic life, to quote the Communist Manifesto, that had existed for hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of years. I mean, it's actually making someone mediate their day-to-day -day life in a different way. And consequently, that kind of way of thinking about things was reflected even in art. Right, hence the Renaissance. But let me just uh, quote something. This is from Anne Klein, who I, I don't know much about her, but I just thought this was always a succinct way of really getting across to people 
the individual per se in the modern sense is really coming out in the bourgeois era. I Meaning they used to call entire towns individuals. So the city of London was an individual. And maybe that made sense because maybe all that mattered was the king. Really, right? I mean, if you think of 10th century medieval England, like if you read some of the writers from them, they just talk about the body politic. It's like one person. So it's, it's like, like the city represents just like a single subject. Like there could, just, there could be millions of people, but there's not, they're just from that city. When we're reading Hegel this Sunday, you know, and he's talking about, you know, the conception of freedom, he's going to say the ancients knew one was free. What, like one single The person. emperor of China was free, okay. right? In other words, and the whole world is revolving around them, yeah. right? Okay. So this is Anne Klein. I don't know much about her, but I just thought this was a good quote. So the, the developing sense of individual u uniqueness and personal choice is reflected in changes in the meaning of in of English words individual and self over the past five centuries. In the 15th century, individual meant indivisible. It could be used to describe the trinity. So the, oh, right? God is one, yeah. Or a married couple who were individual not to be parted as man and wife. Since at least the 17th century, however, the term individual has emphasized the separateness, separateness of persons rather than their connection. In the late Middle Ages in Europe, self was a noun representing something to be denied in favor of God and all he represented. Only in 1674, writes Peter Abbs, following the Oxford English Dictionary, did self take on its modern meaning of a permanent subject of successive and varying states of consciousness. With this, the center of meaning was no longer situated in the wider external sphere, in God, society or nature, but came to rest more completely within the narrow boundaries of the individual himself. The Protestant Reformation and the rise of capitalism combined to place persons in an individuated rather than mediated relation to text and God, just at a time when the development of a new class structure and the proliferation of land ownership encouraged the assertion of exclusionary boundaries, particularly between men. And so I'm not going to say the rest of the quote, but it's literally going through when the words self-sufficient, self-knowledge, self-made, self-seeker, selfish, self-knowing, self-determination, like, entered the dictionary. It was, like, during this, this point of like, urbanization and, like, the development of bourgeois society. And we can think also why that maybe would be the case, which is that, you know, in a sense, uh, we were talking about the lords earlier, you know, that you would be the 10th Henry in a line lineage of going back to, I don't know, your great, 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 great uncle... Conquered that area, he was a lieutenant in some military, and it was kind of given to him as part of the conquest. Um, the lords were not even really individuals, you were kind of tied to the land, meaning they were entire political subjects unto themselves. And so kind of everybody was all part of the same kind of political thing. The serfs and basically slaves that ran away into the cities in, you know, this kind of bourgeois revolution happening behind the backs of people. Um, they had nothing but the labor on their backs. Sound familiar? You communist? Yeah? Right? In other words, in not having anything but the labor on their back, the only way in which they could even have a society was one based on work. And if you're in town, I don't know if any of you have siblings, I know some of you have heard me say this multiple times, so I'll say it a third time. I had a sister going, right? And we used to trade chores, like you do the dishes, I'll mow the lawn. We would relate based on time. We would trade. I kind of had an idea of how long it took me to wash the dishes and how long it took her, but I was the one who mowed the lawn, but something like that. And consequently, the, the serfs and the slaves that ran away to the towns, they were kind of similar enough, meaning everybody came from a home economy. This is where the term economics originates from, it's xenophon. Economia, right? It's how to manage the household. And so everybody kind of did the same things. They had to all make the same furniture and the same clothes and the same food. And so consequently, it was possible to specialize and be interdependent based on the exchange of labor. So for hundreds and hundreds of years, this just happened kind of normally. By the time we get to Adam Smith and you get the labor theory of value, now that had already been happening. 
Adam Smith, in a sense, is articulating the esoteric content of what's even implied in this society that completely spontaneously happened behind the backs. Right? This is a this is a Hegel phrase, the ruse of reason. The world spirit seems to operate behind the backs of people. It produces things that then, when the owl of Minerva flies at dusk, we reflect on it and go, oh wow. We see the deep wisdom of it, because the owl of Minerva is wisdom. Um, that what had been happening in the cities was literally spontaneously the new possibility for higher freedom. And that's why going back to my Adam Smith quote, the lords in the countryside couldn't even recognize what the heck was happening in the cities. They were like, this is another species that crawled out of like something. And they looked down upon them, obviously. They're like, they work. They're without honor. You know, work was like profane. We only work because, you know, we bit the, the, the tree of knowledge and we got kicked out of Eden, right? It was, it was the burden, you know? And so the fact that we have this, it's like, ugh, if you work, how is that anything that's good? And yet, what's a common thing that we hear today? Self-sufficiency, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, a self-made person. Every single billionaire in the world right now will tell you they are self-made. I guarantee it. I would happily bet against any of you that they will say that. Of course, of course, it is a modern value to be self-made. The whole point about, you know, pointing out your, your blood in ancient society is that it was just divine order, right? It was nature itself. So this account of the emergence of humans was, for bourgeois society, not just their justification, but the task that they set themselves. So when we think of Adam Smith and the Wealth of Nations, he's talking about, as he calls it, this greatest revolution in happiness that happened kind of despite the intentions of the merchants and the artisans. And it raised the possibility of higher emancipation, but also potentially even worse things. And so, you know, Adam Smith says, well, actually, slavery is worse now than it was, right? Because now, to the degree that somebody has property in their labor, that means they can dispense of the slave however they want. They're not regulated by the order of, like, I don't know, Rome, you, you actually had to treat your slave in a certain way. Rather, they posed a question, coming back to it. Man is born free, and yet everywhere he is in chains. These chains were forged by him, and he tied himself to them. In this sense, there are not enlightenment values or even enlightenment rationality, but rather there was an enlightenment of the society that had come into being. Hence, Adam Smith writes, a revolution of the greatest importance to the public happiness was in this manner brought about by two different orders of people who had not the least intention to serve the public. It's totally accidental. To gratify the most childish vanity was the sole motive of the great proprietors. The merchants and artificers, much less ridiculous, acted merely from a view to their own interest and in pursuit of their own peddler principle of turning a penny wherever a penny was to be got. Neither of them had either knowledge or foresight of that great revolution which the folly of one and the industry of other was gradually bringing about. So that's book three of Wealth of Nations. If you ever read that and then read the Communist Manifesto, the first part of the Communist Manifesto is just Marx and Engels repeating Adam Smith, basically, um, about up until when they start talking about the Sorcerer's Apprentice. And we can see what emerged out of this new society. In, pra in the practice of exchange, uh, two parties respect each other as property owners. For to exchange to happen at all, the consent of both is required. If that doesn't happen, it's, it's theft, it's robbery. Um, and so consequently, what was political economy but politicizing what was already happening in the cities? I mean, our kind of conception of human rights today, your right to bodily autonomy, your right to not be attacked, to get what you work for. I guarantee if I walk up and down the street right now and ask anybody, why do you have the money you have in your pocket? They'll say, I worked for it and get your hands off of it. Right? These are all modern, modern values. And not only were they modern values, but they transformed what it even meant to be a human. And what was happening in the Enlightenment is that they were drawing out the inner telos of the society that developed on the interdependence and cooperation of people through labor. So from then on, the organization of life gained a new purchase. You can find it in the Constitution and Declaration of Independence. Man's inalienable right was the right to labor. 
And I'll just say this, and I know this is going to set off Marxist alarm bells. You can't alienate your labor. What does that mean? It's the first property. Meaning your right to alienate anything at all, to sell anything, follows from the fact that it was your property. So when this is said, you know, when Jefferson just says, you know, we hold these rights to be self-evident, these inalienable rights, that's not like some, he just is saying it. He's like voicing bourgeois society in almost as perfect a way as you could, right? Um, Marx really likes whenever Benjamin Franklin says things because Benjamin Franklin holds things that are common sense that are very modern. Benjamin Franklin is like, well, of course the market is the exchange of labor. Of course, yeah, we all know that. No, that wasn't the case. That wasn't the case for thousands and thousands of years. I mean, the exchange between communities actually was not the exchange of labor. I know you're like, Danny, how the hell is that the case? Didn't people make those things? Yeah, they worked, but it wasn't labor. There wasn't the property right. There wasn't what John Locke just holds to be self-evident that, oh, of course labor is the first property, because if you go up to a tree and you pull an apple off the tree, isn't it your property? Yeah. If that wasn't the case, how could I eat anything? Like the work of like a serf or like even like in the Middle Ages, like a city dweller did not belong to them. Like you're, it's a gla you're a glass blower by nature. You create glass, but it's not like, there's no concept of like self. To begin with. Most of human history, you did not own what you worked for. Yeah. Right? Of course not. Right? In other words, we were just talking about traditional society. And I don't know, half of it you had to give to the person who conquered you. And why? Because they conquered you. And that's it. Yeah. There's not even a good justification. It's like, yeah, we conquered you. And guess what? Might makes right. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah if you could just speak to the relationship between work and labor. Because as I'm seeing it, work is the activity but labor as a modern concept yep. that represents a social relation. Where does that come from? Maybe you already touched on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, this is, this is very helpful. So the reason I, I had emphasized earlier like this anecdote about me and my sister trading chores is because in a sense what was happening was, uh, and it's not like me and my sister were like producing a social relation. That's not what's meant by that. In fact, social relations way deeper. That was just like a personal thing is that what was happening in the towns in the fact that these people really didn't have any personal property at all. I guess they had their tools and the clothes on their back, but you know what I mean, they didn't have land. Yep, yeah. Is that when you would have, you know, you know the origin of marriage, everybody? It's like an agreement between possibly warring communities, oh, yeah. right? I'm gonna have my daughter marry you so we don't end with us chopping each other's head off. Maybe that'll still happen, but that was like a way to, you know, prevent that from happening. And the reason I say that is because, of course, the relationship between different communities in the so-called feudal era was mainly war. That's why it was called the feudal era. They feuded. Mm -hmm. And if they had anything to do with each other, it was mainly happening through some kind of custom of negotiation. And so whatever work was done on the estates, basically, that they owned, in a sense, didn't relate to each other. Mm -hmm. So there weren't even the conditions by which one could even form any real relationship between labor per se, right? Mm -hmm. And not only that, why are the people in the town saying labor is property? Well, one, it's all they have, but two, they're fighting the people in the countryside. They're saying, you guys are exploiters, oh, yeah. right? Meaning like, What's a common socialist thing if we walk down the street and we hear the socialists right now? They'll say, oh, the capitalist exploits your labor. That's a standard bourgeois thing. That is a standard bourgeois discontent. When every single communist and socialist on earth right now says, I'm against the exploitation of labor, they're repeating what was already said in the German towns in the 16th century by runaway serfs. Don't exploit the labor. Yeah, and that's, so, go ahead. that's yeah. like a common sense that develops like the individual aspects. like everybody has a concept of like you're against exploitation or you're against like an elite like hoarding exploitation is a crime yeah exactly exploitation is not a crime in traditional society yeah it's like a virtue like you conquer land and you take over and you make the people your serves it's a tribute yeah yeah in other words you pay me this 
for your protection. Yeah, exactly. It's like the mafia. Yes. Well, that, that's where it, it kind of comes from. So, coming back to this, of why does labor actually even gain the real possibility of being a social relation, it's almost like they were led in their practice to be interdependent in such a way and specialized in such a way that it could even become possible to have society really at all organized in a way in terms of the exchange of different labors. So you know there's all this controversy today, and I, I have a capital teaching online that people can go and watch if they want, the labor theory of value. The labor theory of value is an ought from the bourgeois revolution. In a sense, everybody in this room holds it, and also nobody believes it at the same time. Meaning everybody thinks if I work for something, I deserve it. That is your good bourgeois sensibility. And on the other hand, we also think it's kind of weird to try to explain all the prices that are happening on the stock market through labor, which is not really what Adam Smith or Marx is talking about, but people think that's what it means. So it's really like this idea of labor as property. And by the way, what was meant by that was your personal autonomy. Yeah. Meaning like, you know, if you read John Locke, he's almost just following the deduction that if in nature everything has the right to protect itself, which is really not a right at all, it's the fact that it's going to do it anyways. Every living organism is going to defend itself. He's simply asking why would anybody ever enter into society? Only simply if they could have their freedom respected. That was a kind of just sensibility of bourgeois society. And you could see, like, of course, as people were coming into towns, and I guess they started to differentiate a little bit, there would be journeymen and masters, like in the guilds. That would be a question of why would somebody join our new society. Um, when you mentioned rights, yep. um, I guess that you have to ask, like, what's a right anyway? Like, when the, with the Enlightenment, I usually think of, like, you know, that's when people are talking about the concept of a right now more than ever. And so it's just, where did they even come up with this idea that these things are, are like an individual is entitled to such things? Right. No, this is a good, so the first thing I usually think of is that in traditional society there were duties and privileges, meaning there were things that I owed, basically my natural superior, that's how they would put it, and they had privileges. Um, rights are things that we all equally hold to each other. And again, even if we think of equality, fraternité, liberté, like whatever, all the French Revolution things, we can see how those are no more than the idealization of the very social practice of bourgeois society. Meaning, what are you doing in an exchange, but you actually are equalizing yourself with somebody else? Meaning you are recognizing them as a property owner and I'm a property owner, and Whatever I'm exchanging with you, if you're giving me a Mercedes Benz and I'll give you like, you know, a hostess or something, I don't know. I'm just I'm choosing completely random things. None the sen none nonetheless they're all reduced to some kind of common social value, this property in the sense. Um, so we have equality there. We have liberté, which is that a, an exchange can only happen if both parties are consenting. Um, you know, even the fraternité thing is kind of like the value of cooperation, meaning Adam Smith's image of bourgeois society, of what it could be, is one of people where everybody has dignity and everybody matters and everybody partakes in the development of human freedom. So the rights just, they come out of like society itself, but then you have like these bourgeois writers who are like articulating like what's in the air. So it's like they don't come up with the rights, it's just sort of like, like Rousseau, when he talks about the general will, it's like that's how society's already functioning. They're judging you according to the social practice. Yeah. That's why a, a lot of ways of talking about Kant and Adam Smith and Hegel is that they have a common sense philosophy, which might seem really odd because like Hegel's like this total specialized philosophical thing now which is that they're saying everybody in this room already knows it, and you already know it because you're part of society, and I'm simply making explicit for yourself what you already do. Right, meaning Hegel's Logic, this book that people rack their heads around for decades and decades and decades, according to Hegel's own system, actually you already all know it already. You must, right? 
And so in that sense, all that he's doing is showing to you that you're more free than you even know. Which is a kind of optimism he could take in his time. Same with, same with Kant, right? What, what is enlightenment? We're becoming enlightened about actually the possibilities that we have. And let me say one other thing. I'll just preempt something for the YouTube comments. Okay, so of course, we know, like, you know, Kant doesn't mention, what about women? What about people of color? What about all sorts of things like this, right? Mary Wollstonecraft. Doesn't Rousseau, doesn't he have these different kinds of prejudices? Sure, yes. The question is that the critique of them is still on the basis of Rousseau and Kant. Meaning you can say, actually, what they have articulated is the possibility of everybody transforming and developing. So I always bring up Mary Wollstonecraft's critique of Rousseau, the rights of the vindication of the rights of women. It's a Rousseauian critique. Like, in other words, she's like, Rousseau, you've proved that humans can transform themselves. And so let's just be consistent about that. Right. You know, and likewise, like, in their view, John Locke's view and Adam Smith's view, they thought they had proven that slavery is contradictory and to nobody's interest. Now, obviously, that's a different thing than it literally going out of practice. But hold on one second. If labor is inalienable, it follows that nobody can sell themselves into slavery. And so therefore, if any slavery exists, it's on the basis of coercion. And what's the first right of nature? You can defend yourself, right. meaning it would be justified to fight off your captors. Of course, right? Like it, it actually kind of doesn't even matter what like, I don't know, whatever John Locke is partaking in the Carolina trade or something. They're articulating the very telos of the society we live in. And so consequently, it's not that they're thinking, wouldn't this be a cool idea? They're reflecting on the conditions that actually are making slavery obsolete, obsolete and insufferable and wrong. And that's actually why it's becoming more and more worse. That's why Adam Smith in book four of Wealth of Nations is saying it's actually more intolerable in the English colonies than it is in the French and Spanish colonies because the English colonies are like the bourgeois ones and the French colonies have primogeniture meaning in the English colonies, it's subject purely to the right of labor, so to the worst things, meaning therefore it's literally like, oh, are you gonna treat a person as a thing? Because it's the most contradictory. Right. To exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly, you to specifically yeah. like dehumanize in order for it to be justified, so it's like even worse. So whereas, whereas, so Marx, you know, I don't know, chapter one of Das Kapital for the Nerds, Right? Mm -hmm. He's like, well, Aristotle couldn't solve the question of labor in ancient Greece. Why couldn't he solve it? Because as Marx says, he breathed the air of a slave society, meaning he couldn't recognize the equality of labor because it wouldn't make any sense. Because Aristotle, you know, he's a brilliant person. He's like, okay, logically, a slave is not like a person. Right. Like they don't own themselves. So it therefore follows they can't have be laborers. So all of these like bourgeois thinkers are, it seems like it's like pointing toward like, like a society of like free labor. Like it's point like you, you said, you mentioned like the optimism of the like, Kant Hegel. It's like, it seems like, like with the revolutions too, like pointing toward like a greater emancipation of like all of humanity. Yeah. Like the extension of like free social relations everywhere. And that it could develop, yeah. meaning, uh, so in some article I wrote, I basically said that they were articulating that maybe they didn't recognize everything, yeah. and that a future, future descendants would be able to critique things. And, like, in other words, what most people have a view of in terms of society today, and it's, I'm not saying this in, like, a, a, a paternalistic way, it's, it's the common sense way is that essentially the progress of humanity is more and more people being let into society that were marginalized and were overcoming past prejudices. They're becoming anachronistic. We're seeing them as irrational. That's a very bourgeois view of progress. In other words, that whatever Kant as a person thought, the point is he articulated the means by which humans would be able to recognize each other as humans over time. And we would be able to recognize things and recognize the dignity in people because in practice, society was becoming more interdependent in such a way that your very social being was becoming an object for you. So it was, in a sense, gaining objectivity. So why do we get individuals in bourgeois society? Because maybe for the first time, 
individuals as we know it truly gain like a real objectivity. Go ahead, Ethan. I was just going to say, so um, why doesn't this happen? Well, okay, so I, what Ethan is saying is, Danny, you're an hour in, we haven't got to Marxism yeah. yet. <laughs> this is a little frustrating. All right, so let me try to go a little bit more fast then from the impatience. Um, so that society had come into being, had a profound effect on the very conception of philosophy. Philosophy's proper terrain seemed to shift from not what is, which would have been like Aristotle's domain, the nature of things, but rather what could become. The truth of being, as Hegel showed, was becoming. Man recognized that even the most basic understanding of the world was not passive, but involved in a web of relations of man to the world. That there were a so-called subject-object relation. One didn't just see an apple, but gave form to the object that is an apple. There is something desired in making something intelligible. It was fraught with oughts, in this sense. Hegel's famous phrase that the owl of Minerva flies at dusk, that is that wisdom comes after the fact, is but the self-account of the very reason for Hegel and the bourgeois radicals. What is usually called the bourgeois revolutions, the connected series of the Dutch revolt, the English revolution, American revolution, French revolution, et cetera, et cetera, is really the end of the result, right? Meaning bourgeois society had already been coming into being for hundreds and hundreds of years. As Marx put it, the form went beyond the content. Emerging still out of traditional society, they could only make this revolution by appealing to antiquated forms. Only afterwards, and this is what Hegel's summing up with the Owl of Minerva flying at dusk, can they come into their own, or as Marx puts it, supplant Habakkuk with Locke. So in other words, the revolutions are happening through the appearance of returning to the earliest forms of Christianity or returning to Rome or something. Ancient Greece. Ancient Greece, that they have to emerge out of it. Um, we just read Benjamin Constant yesterday, and he's saying that basically the French Revolution collapses because parts of the Jacobins sort of are trying to treat society like it's Sparta, right? They're not recognizing the liberty of the moderns versus the liberty of the ancients. Or as we're going to get from Hegel on Sunday, the Gothic cathedral of the moderns was something that was unknown to the ancients. The conflation of bourgeois society and the Enlightenment is related to another conflation. This will finally get to Ethan's. You guys have made it. We're finally Marx. getting to Marx. <laughs> okay, cool. But you see, I have to, like, get you there. Yeah. I mean, I can't just kind of start with Marx at first principle. I have to get you there in the first place. Bourgeois society and capitalism. The two terms are not only different, but categorically so. Capitalism was, for Marx, the crisis of bourgeois society. So the crisis of a worker's society is capitalism. And we even know that from the phrase. Because it's not capitalistism. It's not ruled by capitalists, but ruled by capital. Which is not a thing. That's like Marx 101. It's not a thing. That's the important part. right? And it's not even a social relation, as Dick Howard said on a panel. It's a self-contradiction of society. So to say even capitalism, rule of capital, itself is a contradictory and critical phrase. And I feel like that sometimes gets lost and people turn it back into capitalists is a rule of capitalists. Can we be capitalism without like capitalists? We could have capitalism with all co-ops. Yeah. Or like just the state. Sure. Yes. Mondragon in Spain is a co-op. It's a very successful capitalist institution. Yes. Uh, Richard Wolf was here two years ago. I went with somebody in this room, I think. I was there. Zayu. Zayu. Yeah. Zayu just left. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, and Rich Wolf's whole thing is like co-ops versus capitalism. And he's like a Marxist, and as he'll tell you, he's been a Marxist for 70 years. No. I'm sorry. We'll get to it. But like, no, it's not capitalism, it's capitalism. Um, the Industrial Revolution, this goes back to Zach's uh, point which had begun in the late 18th century, but whose full effects are only realized in the 19th century, had undermined the still emerging bourgeois society. So a common thing that I kind of get from people is they go, well, when was it capitalism and when was it bourgeois society? Unfortunately, there's no real simple cutoff because in a sense, the bourgeois revolution was still emerging. We just read Kant yesterday and he says, we're at a crossroads. Right? He's not even affirming the world he's in. When we read Hegel on Sunday, he's not going to affirm the world he's in. 
It's going to say this task is still there. So that ongoing revolution comes into self-contradiction with itself. It's as George Lukács puts it, the tragedy of the bourgeois revolution. At the most general level, the crisis is one of time. A self-contradiction of how to measure or how to judge what matters in society. So again, I was describing bourgeois society as kind of like an exchange of time of people relating on time and specializing and labor, like this is whole thing. So that was a measure, it was a means of bringing people together and cooperating. After the Industrial Revolution, not only in Marx's reading, but basically in any socialist reading, that very measure of time comes to be self-contradictory. As if there were two measures of time, is maybe one way to put it. Or if there was a self-contradiction of time. And I know everyone's looking at me with furrowed brows, like what does that mean? But you actually do know a, a phrase, which is capital and labor which is probably what you've heard all the time. It's the class struggle, capital and labor. So for Marx, that was an expression of the self-contradiction of society. Not the stratification of society, but the self-contradiction of the entirety of society with itself. Or as they put it in the Communist Manifesto, between past and present. Because this undermines the social standard, and thus any form of cooperation, people were led to try to fix things politically. Democracy was the result. The question that has to be asked is, why does democracy become necessary? The phrase proletariat, we're finally getting to it, citizens without property. So the laborers, the newly constituted working class of the cities, what rights did they have if they could not realize their labor, if you were unemployed? You had your right as a citizen. You had your political rights. So what was expressive of the crisis of society was a politically organized working class movement that was organizing the unemployed and pushing democracy. I Meaning democracy for Marx was not a value or something negative. It was an expression of the crisis of society. This is what is usually left out all the time. Meaning, you know, I'm just thinking of over the summer we did uh, some, uh, we read um, like August Nymph's book, for example, uh, a recent book on where he just goes through different socialists and liberals. And he kind of puts it like the class struggle is democracy versus anti-democracy. So for Marx, the class struggle is the self-contradiction of democracy. It's a little bit different. Meaning the working class has an interest both in labor and capital. Right, so wages are capital. Uh, the workers have an interest in capital. They have an interest in all of civilization hitherto, right? All the technology, all the development of society, all the beautiful music you listen to, and all the art, all of that is capital. It's the full development of civilization. And yet at the same time, the workers have an interest in mattering in the present, meaning to quote my friend Joan Robinson, the only thing worse than being exploited is to not be exploited under capitalism. Right? Meaning, if you're not being exploited under capitalism, unemployed, oh, yeah. the class, we, you know, it's very, it's extremely, 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 extremely unfortunate, and it's a terrible mark on our society that we live in a city that is very much marked by this. In other words, an expression of the crisis of society. Yeah. Like, Go ahead. I'm just, you're talking about like traditional society. It's like literally illegal to be. It's illegal to be unemployed. unemployed. Yeah. yeah. You can read like the, uh, I don't know what they would call them. It would be like the orders of Queen Elizabeth. And it's like if somebody's unemployed, cut their ear off. Whereas today, it's, not only is it naturalized today, it's there's a whole, a whole branch of economics. Oh, it's labor economics. Yeah. There's a labor market. Meaning if I was to go and get my friend Adam Smith and show him a labor class, he would go, this entire society is in crisis. Adam Smith did not think any permanent condition of unemployment was possible because in his view, the beauty of social cooperation is that people can always specialize and develop and we can always find something for anybody. After the Industrial Revolution, which really in Marx's reading is actually pushed by the constitution of the working class itself, so the working class proletarianizes itself, it's the working day chapter, Basically what had happened 
is that the greatest power that the working class had was their cooperation. And in and through the Industrial Revolution, they had kind of politicized their own social power against them in the form of, as Marx puts it, capital. And it's expressed in the way in which political economy started to change how it would talk about things. Because it would talk about labor, uh, excuse me, it would talk about capital as past labor or dead labor, right? Or Ricardo will talk about past labor employing present labor, like these kind of un here things. In other words, to take it out of so-called economic language, it was like one is dependent on the past in society. Okay, so if capital is the past, now it's starting to make sense maybe why we have this term capitalism, right? It seems like the past dominates the present. And we see this reflected in other things that show up also in the 19th century. So what does Nietzsche say? Humanity is suffering from a sickness, a historical sickness, right? Where we seem to be dominated from our past, right? Freud would make a science out of this. It's a neuroses. Meaning we're living through a kind of crisis of a contradiction of history. That's what capitalism meant for Marx. The way that he used to put it is that the 16th century, so you can think of, as I was talking about earlier, the people running away to the towns, the early part of the bourgeois revolution leading into the Enlightenment, is repeating after the 19th century, uh, in the 19th century, after the Industrial Revolution. We just read two weeks ago a classic pamphlet from the French Revolution by a person, Abbe de Sies. What is the third estate? It's all those who produce and work, and those who hold themselves, going back to your question, to common law, which is the rights, meaning all of us hold each other's rights. Um, if I have this right, it's because I also uphold all of your rights. That's the condition for my right. In Marx's reading, in the 19th century, the revolt of the third estate is happening again, but under changed conditions. And that's why the working class, the, the proletariat, is reaching for Adam Smith, and they're reaching for the classic bourgeois revolution to make sense of what's happening. There's a famous phrase for this from the 18th Brumaire, right? The, uh, the tradition of, uh, of dead generations weighs on us like a nightmare. That's Marx basically saying that in the 19th century, the problem is we're kind of repeating an 18th century revolution when it's become anachronistic. And yet the only form by which we even know there's a problem in society is basically through 18th century forms. So one way to kind of talk about capitalism, this is the classic way, a contradiction of bourgeois social relations. And this is what Zach was uh, preempting about an hour ago, an industrial society. So bourgeois social relations, industrial society. The industrial revolution came out of bourgeois society. They're not identical. The Industrial Revolution undermines bourgeois society. What do people demand in a society where their conditions for living are undermined, for them to be made right? In other words, what do the workers demand but bourgeois society? So the workers are thrown out of bourgeois society and they demand bourgeois society. Or if you go to the earliest you know, passage I know where Marx even says the word proletariat, what is the proletariat but the dissolution of society? So it was meant by something like, you know, now I'll get into kind of Marx's method a little bit. When they're saying something like, you know, uh, the proletariat, right? So we know that on the one hand, that's a kind of contradictory term. The workers are saying we don't have property, and yet they do have property. They have their labor. And yet it seems like they don't because in a sense they can't realize that right in society. And so one of the classic rights of the socialist movement was the right to work, which for Adam Smith would have seemed like overwrought. Like, oh, not only does everybody have a right to work, we want as many people as possible working. Yeah. And yet all of a sudden we seem to suffer from, we can't find enough jobs for people. Even in this current market, unemployment is 3.8% officially, right? Let alone underemployment and everything else like that. So in a sense, What's happening after uh, the Industrial Revolution is we're overproducing bourgeois society and it's leading people to try to put bourgeois society back together. And that's where this kind of phrase capitalism comes from. Go ahead. I Somebody raise it. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I guess, how does automation come into play? Because it's like now things are even more automated. Mm -hmm. Like even back then, Industrial Revolution, people were making machines to do, you know, the, the equivalent of work of a yeah. bunch of people. 
at the same time. So. Yeah, no, this is a, this is a good question. So one, this is why the only reason automation really has the effect it does is because it's built on the basis of bourgeois society. I mean, it's based on a society that values work where one's very existence is based on being a useful, productive member. Because, of course, steam engines existed in Alexandria, ancient Greece, but they were toys. Right? It's always pointed out that Hero of Alexandria like, had a little steam engine, and I know this existed in, in ancient China as well. They had steam engines and things like that but they didn't have the same social function. Meaning the classic phrase from capital is, it's not the steam engine that produces the industrial revolution, but the industrial revolution that produces the necessity of the steam engine. Because then what was coming out of basically this kind of raging class struggle was in a sense the need to replace workers. And the only basis by which one could do that was in a sense to grasp the social cooperative powers of the workers in an alienated objective form. And the reason I bring this up is the early socialist, if you were to say machinery to them, they would go, that's bullshit, how dare you even say that? And which sounds weird, I just looked at everybody's eyebrows and what are you saying, Danny, you're saying these ridiculous things. Because for them, they would say, that machine only exists because workers produced it. And it only operates because of the cooperative action of workers. And really, the machinery is only machinery because the cooperation of the workers is, in a sense, owned by somebody against us. And I say this because Marx, obviously, sympathetic with them. They're wrong. Right? Meaning, what they were reflecting on is they were trying to make sense of the crisis of society in a bourgeois manner. Because in the final instance in bourgeois society, if labor is the first property, it ought to be that everything is labor. And yet, in the kind of reading of what the effects are of the Industrial Revolution, it's why I said the steam engine is the product of the Industrial Revolution, is that the workers, in a sense, had already proletarianized and estranged themselves before we even get the steam engine coming into factories. Meaning, literally, the Industrial Revolution is literally a revolution. There was a social revolution that happened that we relate to in a bourgeois manner. That's the way that Engels points it. Meaning when we talk about the Industrial Revolution, and you know, you hear it in your classes, it's like, I don't know, a bunch of Englishmen created like steam engines and cool. Babbage, whatever, that was one of the people. Arkwright, cool, whatever, now we produce more things. No, the Marx, Engels, but actually they're getting it from all these other people, Andrew Urre is that, no, like, society literally undermined its very basis, but we relate to it in a manner that actually is like we relate to it as if we're still in Adam Smith's time. So the reason I bring that up in terms of automation, and let's go even farther. Let's just say robots. Let's say we're living in an iRobot universe, right? We're in sci-fi. It would still be a question of the robots either count as the property of somebody or they would have to count, or we would grant them bourgeois rights. Yeah. <laughs> Meaning either, I don't know who the lead robot is in that robot, I forget. Somebody know? Sonny. Sonny, our friend. Our friend that the, who becomes friend, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. Either they count as workers, and we push the proletarianization of society even further, or they count as property. Either way, we're getting capitalism. I mean, overcoming capitalism is not going to happen through automation. It's only going to happen through humanity consciously recognizing in practice, in a practical fashion, the contradiction and transcending it as such in practice. Revolution. An actual revolution. Okay, so let me get into a little bit of it. That was a good question because, of course, I'm not saying this is what you're saying, but the Industrial Revolution, I think, to us seems rather like the way that Engels uh, describes it, and it always sits with me, is we kind of think about it in a quantitative fashion, that people went from producing a bunch of stuff to producing a lot of stuff, and that's basically what happened. And the reason that it has to look like that is actually an expression of capitalism, meaning the qualitative change is in a sense uh, misrecognized through bourgeois forms. We recognize it through forms of the Adam Smith era and the Kant era, and they're not adequate to actually grasping the potentiality of society. So it's another Marx thing, the base and the superstructure. I'm sure all of you have taken a sociology class 101 and they're like, here's the Marx way, whatever. 
write an essay about it. The superstructure, the superstructure is what we see. The base is industrial society. So in a certain sense, we suffer from, we do things that go beyond the way in which we can make them intelligible for us. Like if I was in an elevator and you had to ask me what capitalism was in a second, I would have to be like, the world is different than we think, and I would just run out of there. But obviously that's not satisfactory. And then the question is, how does one even know that? And so it leads into, Marx was only ever a Marxist because there was a proletarian socialist movement. Meaning Marx could see what he could see, because in a sense the problem, the very category of capitalism was coming out of the own, at the worker's own struggle to emancipate itself, to overcome itself as proletariat. That he could even see the contradiction. So the reason I brought up earlier, like, the industrial revolution is disintegrating bourgeois society and the workers are trying to put it back together. Any person going to get a job right now is you're partaking and putting back together an anachronistic form of social life. I'm not blaming you. you this is all you have. There's, there's no blame here. This is the world that we live in. Marx's point is that he could recognize, he could give an account of why he could even see what he could see through the proletarian socialist movement's own self-contradiction. So it's not that there was a proletarian and Marx said they're the good guys. They're the most contradictory expression of society. Citizens without property. Proletarian labor. Labor that destroys its property. That makes no sense to John Locke. I know all of you have read the Second Treaties. You have to. I'm sure it's like 101 classes, or you like have to read it. It makes no sense to have labor that destroys its own property. Right. And yet that's what happens in capitalism. One is not stolen from, they actually destroy their own labor. <coughs> capitalism is the greatest destruction of private property. I don't know who, there's libertarians on campus, we're capitalists, we love private property. That's not what Marx means by capitalism. No, capitalism destroys private property. Yeah. Capitalism socializes production. Capitalism expropriates the capitalists. Everything that's accused of by the communists, capitalism has been doing for 200 years. So then that goes into this question of what is communism for Marx? Well, communism is a symptomatic expression of capitalism. It's not that communism is the good thing, capitalism is the bad shit. No, communism is how we even know there's capitalism. So, you know, just to read a little... Um, this is from a, a letter that Marx wrote in 1843. So it's basically Marx telling his friend Arnold Ruga, and he would only be his friend for a little bit more, and then him and Engels were like, I could get it. Um, so this is Marx, and I'll try to do it in my best Marx voice, which is my voice. In fact, so this is about a journal that they're writing, but it, it's just Marx's views about communism. In fact, the internal obstacles seem almost greater than the external difficulties. For even though the question where from presents no problems, the question where to is a rich source of confusion. Not only has universal anarchy broken out among the reformers, but also every individual must admit to himself that he has no precise idea about what ought to happen. However, the very defect turns to the advantage of the new movement, for it means that we do not anticipate the world with our dogmas, but instead attempt to discover the new world through the critique of the old. Hitherto, philosophers have left the keys to all the riddles in their desks, and the stupid, uninitiated world had only to wait around for the roasted pigeons of absolute science to fly into its open mouth. Philosophy has now become secularized, and the most striking proof of this can be seen in the way that philosophical consciousness has joined battle not only outwardly, but inwardly too. And just to step aside for a second, we'll read also even earlier Marx. He's talking about the disintegration of Hegelianism. So Marx's first insight into there being any problem in the world is the way in which Hegelianism itself disintegrates. That none of the young Hegelians can maintain Hegel's standpoint. They can't forward the revolution in the same way. Meaning it's no longer adequate to kind of summarize our new freedom, but the question that the young Hegelians used to ask themselves is, instead of an owl of Minerva, we need an eagle of Apollo. So if you know, you know, birth of tragedy, you know you're Greek, Apollo is giving form. So we can't summarize, we can't become enlightened about the world that's come to be. We have to change the world 
Sound familiar to all the people who are reading Marx on Wikipedia? Philosophers hitherto have interpreted the world, the point is to change it. Every young Hegelian already asked that when Marx was like 10. It was just a standard problem. Okay. If we have no business with the construction of the future, so here's Marx saying, I'm not about the future, or with organizing it for all time, there can still be no doubt about the task confronting us at present. The ruthless criticism of the existing order, ruthless in that it will not shrink neither from its own discoveries nor from conflicts with the powers that be. So this is the part I want everybody to hear every sentence very closely. <clears throat> so this is Karl Marx. I am therefore not in favor of our hoisting a dogmatic banner. Quite the reverse. We must try to help the dogmatists to clarify their ideas. In particular, this is Karl Marx. In particular, this is Karl Marx. Communism, this is Karl Marx, <laughs> is a dogmatic abstraction. And by communism, I do not refer to some imagined possible communism. But the communism, as it actually exists in the teachings of Cabet, Desmet, and Wittling, etc. This communism is itself only a particular manifestation of the humanistic principle and is infected by its opposite, private property. So just to stop for a second, Karl Marx, this is Karl Marx, father of communism? Yeah. Karl Marx. He just said communism is a dogmatic abstraction. This is Karl Marx. And he just said it's infected by its opposite private property. Of course, because who is Marx reading at the time? He's reading, he's doing some political economy stuff. He's reading, he's figuring out that communism is the perfection of private property. That the whole contradiction of capital and wage labor is not done away with in communism. It's actually perfected. You're actually even intensifying it in a certain way. And it's like, why would you do that? Okay. The abolition of private property is therefore by no means identical with communism. Of course not, because capitalism already abolishes private property. And communism has seen other socialist theories, such as Fourier and Proudhon, rising up in opposition to it, not fortuitously, but necessarily, because it is only a particular one-sided realization of the principle of socialism. And I'll just say another thing around this time. So the earliest letter from Engels to Marx that I know, because you know they didn't like each other when they first met each other. They first met each other, they didn't like each other. So when they started to talk, finally. Engels writes Marx, and he, he's talking about, I think it's Bremen in Germany, and he goes, yeah, everybody's a communist here. All of the upper classes are communists, the police chief's a communist, all of these things like this. Lenin has a great article on this. And the reason I bring this up is because, for them, communism was just like the expression of the opposition to the world that was. And so... Engels, many years later, actually 40 years after this, and unfortunately after Marx had passed away, uh, he would write that me and Marx became friends not because we realized that communism was a future state of things, but that it was an insight into the nature of the struggle of the proletariat in the present. Meaning Marx and Engels become communists because they're giving a critique of communism. They're critical participants in the communist movement Back to the first thing I said, what is scientific socialism? Wow. Self-conscious. They know that actually communism is driving capitalism. Mm -hmm. In other words, what is the relationship between capitalism and communism? When you read the Communist Manifesto and they're like, oh, you accuse the communists of this, but capitalism already done this? It's because capitalism like, is communism. Yeah. It's the real movement of history. And, and the critique of capitalism is like its greatest... Like, uh, it, it allows it to like, self-revolutionize. It allows it to self-revolutionize, right? And in other words, he, he says it when he's, they're also young, they say the young Hegelians are the true conservatives because they think that they can reinterpret something and overcome it, but really they're actually giving the theoretical veal to its transformation. So in other words, one of the problems that starts to happen, and it's why I said the uh, repetition of um, the 16th century and the 19th century, is it's not like capitalism's this thing and you just jump over it like it's a castle. It's a crisis, and that crisis can transform. And what Marx is saying is the proletarian, socialist, communist movement, red flag, rada, yeah, yeah, let's go, is the real movement of history. That's the greatest potential of transforming capitalism and preserving capitalism. So why would you critique the workers' movement? Because that's the greatest resource for more capitalism. 
In other words, you know, just skipping ahead a little bit, what does Marx see in 1848? He sees a mass democratic socialist movement save capitalism. That's the lesson. Yeah. yeah. Not only save it, transform it and allow it to boom in a way that it hadn't before. So the Paris Arcades is something that comes out of that. There were utopian socialists, Sansimonian socialists. Um, so anyways, coming back to the letter, and then I'll, I'll get to that point. So our program, this is Karl Marx, must be the reform of consciousness, not through dogmas, but by analyzing mystical consciousness obscure to itself, whether it appears in religious or political form. It will then become plain that the world has long since dreamed of something of which it needs only to become conscious for it to possess it in reality. So I think the way that Chris put it actually once is that socialism is like the fever dream of capitalism, right? Um, you know, in other words, everything that someone is demanding from socialism already happens, but it happens unconsciously, right? That what is the image of the Communist Manifesto, the free association of producers, and social, you know, expropriate the expropriators. The capitalists are already expropriated. They already get expropriated. All of these things, property is already destroyed. All of the stuff is already happening, but it happens in a kind of unconscious manner. And because it happens in an unconscious manner, it in a sense cannot be mastered, and so thus we suffer from it. Right? And I'll, I'll say a little bit more, and then that will get into Marxism as politics, and then we can talk more. Um, so it will then become plain that our task is not to draw a sharp mental line between past and future, but to complete the thought of the past. I Meaning, here is Marx saying, we have not completed the bourgeois revolution. Lastly, it will become plain that mankind will not begin any new work, but will consciously bring about the completion of its old work. Meaning you could say that communism, in a sense, was the repetition of the bourgeois revolution, the desiderata, after the industrial revolution. So when Marx is saying it's nothing new, it's not like capitalism, communism. You know these charts? It's like slave society, feudalism, <laughs> capitalism, <laughs> communism. Well, first of all, the first two ones are bourgeois categories, because feudalism is not a thing. Feudalism is what the bourgeoisie called the people in the countryside. They said, you feud, we have civil society, we're civil, you guys fight. We're civil, you fight. It's not a real category. It's like a pejorative. It's like, you guys suck. And you can only like, recognize them in retrospect. Like, nobody's going to call themselves. Like, it's a retrospect. Yeah. Slave society. It wasn't like, any, oh, it was a slave society. No, it's like, obviously we go, these are enslaved people. It's not a free society. But furthermore, it's not like communism is a next stage. And in fact, around the time that Marx writes this letter, and we'll read this in the manuscripts, he says, communism is not a next stage. And it's not the telos of the end goal of humanity, but it's a dynamic principle. Meaning, in a sense, capitalism is unconscious communism. And the question is, what would be required to master it? To master the kind of regressive dynamic, such that it actually could be overcome. That's the kind of Marx deal. And that's why he's linking up, like, okay, the proletariat is demanding communism, because it's their contradictory way of demanding bourgeois society. Um, okay, so I was going to say something about Richard Wolff and Yaron Brook. They were on Penn's campus two years ago. I guess I'll say it. Why not? It's a fun thing, and then we can talk about the politics. Um, so just a little anecdote. So Yaron Brook of the Ayn Rand Institute, Capitalism and Unknown Ideal. That's her book. And Richard Wolff, Marxist Marxist, of the most Marxist ever. Uh, they debated on Penn's campus two years ago. I don't know. Capitalism versus socialism or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, Yarn Brook is like, what we, what we need is respect for individuals and private property. And Richard Wolff is like, we need democracy and co-ops. Yeah. And my question was like, because I got up there with a COVID mask on, and I was like, all right. Um, so, Yaron, you're kind of talking about bourgeois society. And Richard, you're kind of talking about the industrialization of society. And what's that? Yeah. Right, meaning if Marx was there, he would be like, these are two sides of the contradiction. It's not like the Marxist Marxist who will tell everybody he's been a Marxist for 70 years is like the Marxist side. He's actually just saying one side of the contradiction. And all of those things are like demands of the proletariat. They're all demands of the proletariat, yeah. right. So, and actually, as a contradiction, the point is you have to work through it. Right. So I just kind of, you know, ask them right there like, 
actually, how does one make sense of this? And then I also asked Richard Wolff, I'm like, doesn't Karl Marx have a critique of communism? And he said, no. And I went, well, that's interesting. And that was about that. Um, because we know in the manuscripts, which is another thing Marx wrote about this time, he says, communism is driven by the same greed and avarice as the capitalists. He says about the communists. Meaning they're leveling down. They want to reduce everybody to the same thing. Karl Marx says that. This is not my opinion. So what he's saying, basically, uh, is that, you know, in other words, communism is the problem of his age. It was the way in which the, contra the historical contradiction kind of manifested itself. Now I'll say one more thing, and then I'll shut up, and we'll get some uh, people can say things. Um, politics. So we know Marx has this whole critique of uh, communism, and then he has the Communist Manifesto, and he's like pushing for communism. He's in the Communist League. It's renamed the Communist League because of him. So Marxism is a sui generis form of politics, which is in a sense that the question is how to kind of raise the kind of grasping of the contradiction practically uh, in a manner uh, for mass politics of people, meaning there already was a working class movement, there already was a socialist movement in Marx's time. And his question that Marx was asking in terms of when he would like say formulate a program is what kind of things would lead the working class to kind of take up the contradiction of capitalism into its own hands. And so you can read in the Communist Manifesto, whatever, like expropriate the expropriators, institute a single tax or something. None of these policies by themselves are really the answer, because as they say in the paragraph right above it, all of these things are kind of steps to them grasping the contradiction. Because who exploits the workers in the final instance? The workers. And so the question is how to get there. And also, the other way you have to get there is you have to go through the forms in which the contradiction manifests in the present. Otherwise, it would be dogmatic and sectarian. And so, why does Marx become a communist? Why does he pick up the critique of political economy? Because the workers are politicizing political economy, because they're communists. And so the question is, how could they become self-conscious through such? Now, the reason I bring that up is because when we reflect on Marxism today, uh, you know, usually when people think of it is they think of it like, I don't know, a theory of the world or something, or there's like communists versus capitalists, as I was just talking about with Richard Wilk. And, you know, back to this kind of platypus point, and I'll say the slogan for YouTube, the left is dead long with the left, meaning in a sense what has been evacuated is any kind of politically effective movement that could actually manifest that kind of question. Mm -hmm. Meaning we kind of only have that idea of Marxism as this thing that existed. And, you know, in a sense, there's a lot of sense of progress over it. And, you know, I challenge it usually, not in the sense that did Marx get everything right, but in a sense of have we overcome that kind of problem that he articulated, which is different. It's not about like you have to give, I don't know, everybody go study Adam Smith and do some critique of political economy or something, because maybe capitalism manifests in a different way of course, but rather what would an emancipatory politics look like today? So anyways, I'll just, you know, kind of end there, kind of thing like that. Uh, that was a little scatterbrain. Uh, also, we have a reading group on Sunday and stuff. Um, also, Q&A. Yeah, so I don't know, some kind of thoughts or, or things. It's hard to say all of it because there's, when I did this, I did this teaching on Lenin in February, Lenin's Marxist critique of Marxism. So that's another rabbit hole. It's like, isn't Lenin the Marxist? Lenin's the greatest critic of Marxism ever. It's like, Danny, why are you just pick a stopping point already? It, it did sound like you were bringing in all of our weekly readings from the reading group together, and you had to kind of pick and choose. And my mind is still going, okay, when do we get to Marx in our reading group? So we have more yeah. answers. But yeah, there are more questions than answers as you listen to those talks. That's good. Yeah. I know it might be unsatisfying, but it's, it's good. The answers are like fulfilling. Um, I mean, the thing about when we get to the second part of the syllabus is that you can't even sit on Marxism as an answer, ultimately. Mm -hmm. Meaning, maybe Marxism saved capitalism. 
right? Maybe it became a form of adapting people to the same problem that it was trying to overcome. Um, yeah, obviously that's not a problem that Marx had to deal with, but in a sense it was one that showed up in you know the second generation of, of Marxists. But what I guess what I was trying to just put in people's minds is this question of like thinking about politics and thinking about the problem, meaning the world is way more political today than was ever expected in the 18th century. It was not supposed to be political like this. And yet it's kind of naturalized, like, okay, there's like the two-party system and they both suck, whatever, and you know, you pass legislation or something and there's unemployment. There's all sorts of things that actually signal uh, that we live in the crisis of bourgeois society that are completely naturalized. The police, the state, like all these things. Yeah, go ahead. Is it, is it politics you're making us think of or economics? Oh. My oh. brain is going more towards the societal aspect and the economic aspect of things. When, when you say perhaps that, I'll, I'll come to your question as well. When you say that they're also related, I mean, political economy, related, yeah. political economy was politicizing the civil society. They used to call it the economic sphere. So Marx is known as like whatever, he's going to give an economic explanation. But as he puts it kind of early on, or in 1859, he goes, what I'm really doing is that what was called the economic sphere is what Hegel called civil society, or John Locke called civil society. And the reason I bring that up is that the question is really the contradiction between civil and the civil and political sphere, which is embodied in the proletariat, citizens without property, which is a contradiction from a bourgeois standpoint meaning the very justification for one's political rights is based on your human rights, your property and yourself, right? And consequent, you know, it's like a standard John Locke thing. You would enter into the social contract by which you would have political representation. What is the justification for the state? The only justification for the state is that it's upholding the rights of natural society. Otherwise, it's simply a force that's conquering you and you have the right to defend yourself. Right, this is why, I think this goes to your question, uh, rights don't come from the state. The state can violate rights, they can protect your rights, but they don't originate with the state. If they originated with the state, I'll say something that will defend the entire room, which is then we would never be able to say that government doesn't represent the will of the people. Because we allow the government to be constituted and like rights come from society the, state comes from the only justification it has is in that sense. Yeah. yeah. So to uh, to ever say that one doesn't represent the will of the, the people, that's like a modern thing that presupposes the distinction of civil society from the political sphere. Now they're related, and in a sense, they become contradictory because the way in which the working class is trying to solve the problem of civil society is through the political sphere. I think also in this letter, I didn't quote it, but Marx talks about people becoming conscious of the problems of civil society and how they fight it out in the political sphere. So in and through democracy. Democracy is becoming a problem because I can't find my representation and fulfillment in the cooperative voluntary practices of civil society. And so I'm led to re rely on the one last right I have, which is my right as citizen. And not only that, I'm driven by injustice, which is that, you know, why were we kicked out of this factory we're being screwed over by greedy bosses who are stealing from us. And so thus the government ought to step in to set things right. Um, Woodrow Wilson or FDR in their campaign speeches, they say in Thomas Jefferson's time, you could suppose that anybody could get a job, right? Like in other words, there would always be some kind of fair contract. But after the industrial revolution, we can no longer assume that one can meet their rights like such. And so consequently, the justification for the progressives in the United States was that the government has to step in to realize the rights of, of people in civil society in that way. In a way that was not foreseen. I mean, we just read Benjamin Constant yesterday. Political liberty for him is that simply your rights are upheld. The fact that the state grows in the way that it does, it, there's a recrudescence of the state. The state comes back. To quote my friend Engels, the state is the admission that society cannot regulate itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, the very existence of the state for Engels is saying there is a crisis in society. The self-regulating society 
That's the ideal of bourgeois society. All of your anarchist friends, they're just liberals. <laughs> and it makes you laugh, but of course, because anarchism is liberalism and hysterics. Meaning it doesn't recognize what changed. It simply sees the state as an alien power sitting atop society. Mm-hmm. It repeats the revolt of the third estate. Like libertarians. You know, like libertarians, right? Meaning the libertarians... What, I don't know, Tom Woods, he's one of these Mises Institute people, because I know too many libertarian things because I read a Marxism libertarian thing about them. Tom Woods is like, what's the state? It's the people with the guns. He's just repeating literally the Abyssias that we read. Abyssias is like, why is the first two estates? Because they conquered us a thousand years ago and they made up a bunch of bullshit about themselves. Like, oh, we're Gauls, we're Franks, or whatever. You know, they dress themselves up and they take a tribute from us. Mm-hmm. That's where the kings and the lords come from. Elites. That's where the elites come from. Yeah. And so the reason I bring that up is that the state, the recrudescence of the state, the state is coming back back in the 19th century as a function of the crisis of that ongoing revolution. So the laissez-faire would not be entertained in that? Say more? Like, basically, like, leaving, the, leaving society to itself is not the solution you're saying. It's no longer become... It's not adequate, yeah. Not it, it, it Literally, you know, in Paris, I don't know, 1848, there's just, they're cannonballing people in the streets, right? Like, in other words, and not only that, okay, so laissez-faire, right? So let it be. And it comes from the physiocrats, and it actually was a way of the physiocrats wanting to tax agriculture. There's a whole long story behind it. It's a really funny thing. The reason I bring that up is because who is driving the statification of society? It is the working class, because in response to their proletarianization, they're relying on their political rights to make up for the fact that society cannot realize their rights as labor. And so the reason I bring that up is because progressivism, like the early 20th century thing, kind of late 19th century Teddy Roosevelt thing, it deals with the problem of capitalism by just kind of papering over it by seeing that as just, yeah, we learned, or yeah, things have changed. Whereas for Marx, it's kind of like, no, the contradiction is being transformed. And that's why there's a contradiction of civil and political sphere. And we know this in the 20th century. There's a word for this that everybody says the first time they come to the reading group. They say imperialism. Where does the term imperialism come from? The imperial state. What are the imperial states? The Bonaparte state, imperial Germany, it's all of the it's all of the farcical revolutions coming out of the nineteenth century. Which are constituted by the working class. Which are constituted. So imperialism is constituted by the working class. Imperialism is a problem of democracy. Yeah. It's a self contradiction of democracy. That's why there's even a return in a sense. Um, I mean I guess we'll do this in the spring when we read the Lenin's imperialism pamphlet. Yeah. So to my knowledge, the earliest time that Lenin says the word imperialism is he's quoting Marx from the Paris Commune. And when Marx says imperialism in that pamphlet, he says imperialism is the condition when the bourgeoisie can no longer rule. So the bourgeoisie did not rule. They haven't ruled for like 200 years. Tell your friends who have the mug that says they drink bourgeois tears. They have not ruled for like 200 years. They lost in, the eight, in 1848. They're done. Okay, Bill Gates is not the bourgeoisie or something. I don't know. But we're still in capitalism. But we're still in capitalism because to finish the sentence, as Ethan was preempting, the proletariat cannot yet rule. Yeah. So imperialism comes out of, there's a phrase Marx will use, Bonapartism. And he also describes Bonapartism as imperial socialism. Mm-hmm. So socialism saves capitalism. Of course it does. Um, and so the whole question, it's not like socialism was good or bad for Marx. It was the problem. And the rather, the question that Marx put it as was proletarian socialism. So in the Communist Manifesto, uh, when they talk about all the other socialisms, maybe Marx and Engels are being a little, you know, haughty right there, to use this Dusty Vesti term, right? They're like, oh yeah, all the other socialisms are all conservative. They're all reactionary. And the only potentially progressive socialism is proletarian socialism. Because, in a sense, only proletarian socialism would draw the contradiction to its fullest extreme. It would draw 
labor and capital, socialization, democracy is capital, to the furthest extreme such that it could be mediated and overcome by a potential subject. And to quote my friend Max Horkheimer, socialism is that potential subject. So the whole goal, the whole purpose of socialism or communism, or whatever you want to call it, I don't care anymore. <laughs> I don't, I've given up, I don't care. The whole purpose is setting up a practical and tractable way of even dealing with the problem. You don't actually solve the problem getting there. You set up the possibility of solving the problem. Communism is not the goal. Communism is the image of the goal. Communism is how we understand the problem. It's like uh, work, like, I think Lenin says at some point, like, the, you can only truly work through, like, the problem of dialectic, like, when you already have, like, the dictatorship or the proletariat. Like, it's the height of the contradiction. So you said the other phrase. I'm glad you said it. Uh, yeah. it the, the controversial one. And it's the one that Marx says is the only original thing he's ever said. Uh, the necessity of the dictatorship of the proletariat. And this is where, you know, people start to feel the, like, you know, what is it, the hair on the back of the neck and the kind of, <laughs> like, uh-oh, you said the taboo thing. Um, so what is Marx witness in 1848 that he changes his mind about things? So going into 1848, and this is in the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels, basically their image of how a socialist revolution would play out would be, it would be a democratic revolution. They have studied their European revolutions, you know, 1789, 1830, Les Miserables, they've studied these revolutions. And the basic idea is that in a democratic revolution, the left wing kind of comes out and kind of drives it. And it might get too far ahead of itself, but even when there's a little bit of a thermidor, it will be enough to kind of push things over. So the idea is to be the kind of radical wing of, of the democratic revolution. And their view is essentially that the proletariat will be the most consistently democratic, the most consistently revolutionary, the most consistently radical, and that consequently all they have to do is kind of make the goal conscious. What's coming out in the middle of the 1848 revolutions is in a sense the problem of democracy and the proletariat, which is actually what happens in 1848, to quote Marx, is all of France holds hands to put down the proletariat. Meaning democracy puts down the proletariat. Democracy saves capitalism in 1848. And starting from that place onwards, and that you'll be familiar with this, uh, the address to the Communist League in 1850, this is a favorite of Lenin's, where Marx starts to say, actually, we have to distinguish ourselves from the general democratic socialist kind of movement. We need the independence of the proletariat. I mean, they're starting to get this idea that actually within the democratic movement, you have to have the independence of the proletariat. To us today, I mean, obviously why this looks like an important thing to someone like Lenin is it seems like they're groping towards this party question. Mm -hmm. That you actually have to distinguish the proletarian line from the general democratic line. Um, otherwise, the democratic line will swamp the, the potentially emancipatory thing. By the end of 1848, what Marx basically sees is Louis Bonaparte, the nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte, and I will be seeing the movie, apparently it's four hours. Um, I still see it in IMAX. He sees uh, Louis Bonaparte lead a democratic mass revolution, overthrow the legislator, exploit the capitalists, organize the unorganized, meaning he gives poor people and unemployed young men cannonballs to go shoot at rich Parisians, and gives them food and sausages and the arms of courtesans to do so. And that saves capitalism. And it looks like a democratic socialist revolution. And to quote Guizot, who is a this historian who's responsible for kicking Marx out of, I think, Brussels, he says, this is the triumph of socialism. So according to Guizot, socialism already won in 1841, 1848, 1851, something like that. Apparently we've already had it. And yet Marx is like, yeah, this is a counter-revolution. <laughs> right? Um, I know. Okay, so what he basically concludes out of that experience, and it's why he changes his mind about this, and in a sense, 90% of Lenin's state and revolution is just him saying, look, we can just see in Marx how he changes his mind. 
is, as he puts it, the necessity, not the dictatorship of the proletariat, the necessity of the dictatorship of the proletariat. I Meaning Marx says, the only new thing I said, I never said anything new about classes, because all of the French historians have already said it. And all of the workers already said it, meaning class is true and false. We do and we don't live in a class society. Because, you know, on the one hand, actually, everybody is equal. They do have equal rights. And class, we don't actually live in, like, a caste society or something. It's like not in law. It's a, it's a form of appearance of a contradiction. Um, he said, the only thing that I basically, you know, said that was new was the necessity of the dictatorship of the proletariat. That in order for the revolution to fulfill itself, it, in a sense, has to have... And it's, he didn't even specify that much kind of what it meant at that time. The necessity of the dictatorship of the proletariat, a kind of proletarian explicit leadership. And where does he get that idea from? He gets it from Louis Bonaparte. Meaning, what is Marxism? He sees what played out and reads history against the grain. He reads the defeat of the proletariat, the possibilities that were also incumbent. So in other words, why do the Marxists always talk about defeats? Because the whole history of Marxism is a defeat. In other words, it was just kind of the idea that one works through forms of appearance and defeats, and that the greatest duty, in a sense, is actually the articulation, uh, the negative articulation of what was possible. And I know that's unsatisfying to people, because then they're like, well, then what's the goal of Marxism? To overcome itself. Yeah, to redeem. Right? To no longer have to articulate on defeats anymore. Hmm. Aha! Yes, the goal of Marxism, if it... The, is, the slogan should be, Marxists, get over yourself. And Marxists, get over yourself. <laughs> Look, Marx and Engels are saying you didn't need Marxism until capitalism. Well, hope, let's about, if you get over capitalism, you don't need Marxism anymore. Yeah. I mean, everything they say, the so-called materialist conception of history, it's all about the point is to overcome Marxism, to overcome what necessitates that as any kind of theory of the world, any insight into the problem. And that doesn't mean to make, like, I don't know, Marx, like, you forget about him, he goes into oblivion. But in a sense, when we talk about Socrates today, it's part of cultural history, it's a beautiful thing, you know, wonderful thing. But Socrates doesn't task us. Maybe he tasks us individually, you read it in your house, you know, okay, I want to be Socratic. He doesn't task us in the way that Marx does. Go ahead, Eric. Oh, no, I, I, so, yeah, I mean, you also had a question, sorry. Well, you answered it all. What, what was your question, and we can also um, say more. The question was, um, sorry. No. no, it was um, how things are more political than ever. And then you mentioned the police, and um, sort of, and so I just want to clarify: by political, do you mean that things are more regulated? There are more, quote, things are more departmentalized. It's um, so I, I think of two things. One, politics is the sphere of coercion of the monopoly on force. To quote Weber, meaning the bourgeois ideal, and we we're we we're talking about this yesterday at the reading group is a world based on reason and freedom and cooperation. In other words, that you could transform things without forcing people to do so. There was the idea that slavery was going to be overcome through reason. That's what Adam Smith kind of thought he was doing. In other words, he's saying, look, this doesn't benefit anybody, and it's unethical, and it's immoral, and it's an attack on everybody's rights. And in a sense, it, it did die out a little bit in the upper states in North America. Now, what complicated it was capitalism. I mean, the Industrial Revolution created a labor problem that then gave a new purchase to slavery. It gave industrial slavery, as, as Marx puts in the Grand Risa. Mm -hmm. So the reason then that I um, bring that up is that it's not Marxism that politicizes civil society. It's that the working class has been led, in a sense, to politicize it such that they're not thrown into oblivion. Right? Like, I mean, that's the best way. I, you know, in other words, what do people do when they're unemployed? They demand the government have a jobs program. And, of course, all of these things carry with them all of the problems of politics that all of the bourgeois radicals already noted. Meaning, like, you know, George Washington in his farewell letter said, don't let this country fall into partisanship, into parties. Right? In other words, the idea of the political sphere was basically just going to be you're simply, I don't know, 
the king of England, the queen, they're like a figurehead, that it wouldn't really matter, and that nobody really cares, and fine, whatever, do your thing, but the actual revolution of society plays out in civil society. And this is still true, meaning you can think of the decriminalization of marijuana or the passage uh, in terms of same-sex marriage. These were things that were already happening in civil society and in a sense put pressure on the state in some manner to just kind of recognize it over time. The, you know, the original bourgeois idea is that like you wouldn't even need that. It's just that you could just reason with people and people would have the freedom to transform themselves truly. That no longer seems to be the case and the very existence of the police is actually proof of the crisis of society. Meaning it's not about um, damning them like personally or morally, it's actually recognizing the necessity of why they're there. And you know, uh, I don't know, when do police come to the United States? Uh, they're literally imported. We imported the uniforms of the Bobbies, the Robert Peels, into the state. And it's coming with industrialization. Yeah. One other thing I wanted to say is, um, Marcos, so kind of veteran platypus member, was on a panel with a woman, Deirdre McCloskey. She's an economist at UIC. She's kind of famous libertarian. She calls herself a bleeding heart libertarian. So you know, a bleeding heart liberal? She's a bleeding heart libertarian. And she was listening to Marcos talk and she said, don't politicize civil society, right? Marcos, he was kind of saying we need to, okay, we would need to organize the working class, something like that. Yeah. And of course, I have a sympathy for her point, but she's wrong. Meaning she's a libertarian, in a sense, doesn't recognize the contradiction of the industrial revolution. And from a liberal standpoint, it's wrong to politicize civil society. Meaning you're trying to change things through force when civil society would change things through reason and cooperation. Mm -hmm. And so when I heard that, it's like, how would Marx respond? He would go, too late. It's already happened. It's already happened. It's not really like a question of it being driven by people's jealousy. And even if it was driven by people's jealousy, it's actually not only too late, it still wouldn't matter because you would still ask, where does that necessity come from? Yeah. So. The, I don't know, the very nerdy economic way of talking about capitalism is a crisis of time. That doesn't really say much to anybody, but it says why is it that the world became political as it did? Why, where, where did the class struggle emerge from? It, emer it emerged as a function of a crisis. It is the crisis of civil society. Who are the will of the people? Is it capital or labor? It's both. It's both. The working class has an interest in both. You know, capital is not the money. Capital wages. It's all of the things that make people's life good. I think standards. All of civilization. In a sense, the interest in labor per se is only what makes you matter. Like right this second. And yeah, and so thus the capitalists can always say we're actually protecting the interest of society, and they're one-sidedly right. We're the custodians of the development of humanity that makes any of our sacrifices worthwhile, to quote Kant, that my children will live a better life than me. Like, they're the custodians of that. Yeah. Other thoughts? This is weird? This is, is this normal Marxism? No. no. Maybe? And you, you left it on a... Odd note. On a point, yeah, like, uh, I don't know, I feel like the usual vision of Marxism is like, like talking about class, like that it's just like an inherently antagonistic thing, or like, you know, let's say this vision of like you get rid of the parasite and then we can have a free society, like when people talk about like, like guillotining like people. Like it's just like a question of like you just get rid of the capitalist, you know? Like how does how does the proletariat re, like how do they have an interest in like reconstituting capitalism? But at the same time they're like, you know, they also have an interest in overcoming it. So Donald Parkinson on one of our panels said like the truth of Marx's materialism is that a man's gotta work. A man's gotta eat. A man's gotta eat. Yeah. Okay. So I said man's got to work, but actually, you, one might not be eating if you don't yeah. have if you're not attached to someone working somewhere. 
right? Meaning even if you're not, that someone somewhere along the line is giving you. Um, like in other words, it's the most simple reason why capitalism gets reconstituted at all. And you know what Marx sees in 1848 is that the unemployed, in a sense, I mean, this is going to sound this is going to sound very unMarxist, and I'm, this is going to be taboo on the left. So I'm going to say this: uh, the unemployed save capitalism in one way in 1848, meaning they're looking for you know the counter revolution can go and hire them and say we'll give you money and food and housing, but you just gotta go, these capitalists and workers are fighting, just shoot them both. That's what happens. Go ahead, yeah. Is that proletarianism? So this, this term, that this is also where this shows up, the Lazarus layer, is, that's where, okay. So lump and proletariat has a bad connotation of being um, sociological, because, you know, I'll never forget that um, when Marx talks about it in the 18th Brumaire, he goes through different vocations. And, you know, he talks about pimps and he talks about prostitution and things like that. And the reason I bring that up is in, when people today read it, they go, well, I'm a sex worker. Am I, isn't that proletariat? Isn't this, like, not lumpen? The point is not really the job that somebody did. The point really is that declassed, meaning apolitical meaning kind of dropping out of any political transformation in society. Because if you go into the question of, like, is somebody unemployed or employed, it's incumbent upon the working class to organize the unemployed because they're the greatest counter to them is the unemployed, right? I mean, it's why the working class have all these songs, right? Casey Jones, the scab, right? But also, of course, in 1848, who is putting down the capitalists and the workers? It is the formerly unemployed. They're given money and food to cannonball the capitalists. Meaning part and parcel of what saves capitalism is the resentment about the capitalists. Like, oh, you want to get back at those motherfuckers? Here you go. So the reason I, I guess I bring that up is that really when they use those terms, and it goes to this thing, class as well. Class is not an economic category. It's a political category, at least for Marx. And I, I, this maybe goes to Ethan's point. In a liberal view, class is a sociological thing. And you can find it in like Smith and Kant. Mm -hmm. And basically what they're saying is that in society, people will have different interests, but at the social level, their interests can be potentially socially productive. So Adam Smith will basically talk about the negotiations between the employer and the employee as part and parcel of the development of society. The higgling is the way that he puts it, right? Meaning the employer gets a surplus off the workers, but then the workers demand higher wages, and then that forces the employer to invest more and increase the productivity, and then that increases the development. He's, he's running this as this gigantic dialectical thing. It's not class in the Marx sense. Proletariat, and it's why I always emphasize the word citizens without property, is political from its just very definition. And so it's really class, you know, the way that Lenin puts it, which can be maybe uh, not infelicitous, meaning like not the easiest way to understand it, is he says, well, it's about state power. But then because state power means everything and nothing today, like, is it Congress? People, no, Congress is not state power. But people think it's state power, like, all over the place. Um, it's really about the executive prerogative, meaning it's about what represents the kind of will of society and what can act in the interest of society. So when Marx and Engels are talking about class then and the class struggle, the, this goes back to Ethan's point, it's as if society has two general wills. There's two wills of the people and consequently two different wills that can act in the interest of the people, which in a situation of conflict can obviously be very violent, yeah. right? Because it can mean you know, like, in other words, what, what, what is the uh, right that a police officer has? They're deputies. They're deputized. They're deputized with the executive prerogative. Even when they do something that ends in a fatality, the justification for that is that they're acting in the interests of society at large, and not everything can be legislated. That's the formal objective reason behind it. And so the reason I say that is, what if that prerogative itself is self-contradictory? Meaning, you know, the way that Marx 
presents it in Capital is he gives this kind of image of right meets right, force decides. The right of the working class meets the right of the capitalists. It's the same right. It's both bourgeois right. It's both the right of labor. Mm -hmm. The workers are saying that factory is ours because we put the labor into it. And the capitalists are saying that factory is mine because I put the labor into it. Yeah. Okay, what if they're both right? Mm -hmm. When right meets right, force decides. Meaning the state doesn't step in like, you know, there's this thing, the class state, that the state is in the interest of capital. It's not in the interest of like capitalists. It's in the interest of preserving the problem. And it's not because they're thinking we're preserving the problem. It's that law and order. <laughs> law and order just means stop, mm -hmm. right? So Chris Catrone, you know, has this story of going to demos when he was a, a young man. He was probably in Sparta's League at the time. And it was a strike. And on one side, there were scabs with guns. And on the other side, there were the strikers with guns. And then there was a police officer with a sniper rifle. <laughs> That's Bonapartism right there. That's Meaning... They're saying, if any of you start doing anything, we'll shoot all of you. Yeah. And the problem is that, at least in Marx's reading, that's actually an expression of contradiction. Meaning we naturalize it today. We go, oh, it's like the umpire. The government's the umpire. Play fair. Right. No, like really the liberal view is what we call anarchism today, which is like, no. Yeah. The, only, the only necessity is like the state st steps in where society seems to break down, and it's like the con concept of that for like Smith or like you know American French revolutionaries is like that's like ridiculous. The the whole justification for the French Revolution, ready? The third estate is already a nation. Yeah. We don't need you guys. Yeah. So then why are we reconstituting? Like. That's, that's why the anarchists have a liberal view. They go, like, you read Kropotkin, right? He's a great Russian anarchist, blah, blah, blah. It's great. He's like, well, in society, if you look at children playing a game, they already regulate themselves. They don't need other people. They play tag. Hey, you know, you broke the rules. We're not playing with you anymore. And so he just kind of is like, see? <laughs> we don't need a state, right? And it's like, that's quaint. And nice, and it warms my heart. And unfortunately, I can't take the principle of the game of tag in such a narrow fashion. So the state is emerging out of 1848. It actually like emerges because if it was simply that the bourgeoisie put the workers down and seized power, in a sense, there wouldn't be a state. So it's that they can't even hold on to it because they can't lead society anymore. Because the society they're trying to uphold they're actually at self-contradiction with. So the way that Marx puts it when he's talking about Germany is that the bourgeoisie are more afraid of their own revolution than the feudal, you know, I don't know, the pretenders or the reaction. Meaning if they press the demands for a republic, then the workers are like, yeah, those are our demands. And they're like, psych, just kidding. We didn't mean it. That's what happens in Germany. They're afraid of their own revolution. All of the rights the workers press our bourgeois rights, the right to work, every single, all, all welfare claims, all unemployment claims, all of it, it all follows from their bourgeois rights. And so they can't even uphold their own revolution anymore. I don't know, Milton Friedman or Yaron Brook, right? Like Yaron Brook, is he like even really a liberal? No. Nobody really is. Nobody really is. Anyway, and nobody really is like, a, like you know, people talk about I'm pro-capitalist. You kind of can't be pro-capitalist. Like, the libertarians are kind of stuck in the 18th century. And maybe we can even sympathize with their concerns. Like, you know, we saw them at, at that rally. We go, yeah, they, they react to the world that's, you know, happened. And they go, oh, this is wrong. Mm -hmm. And from a liberal perspective, it's like, yeah, it is wrong. Mm -hmm. The question is, why is it the case? They kind of can't explain that part, but you can understand why it's the case for them, why it appears that way.